Good afternoon, and welcome to, uh, welcome to our event today. Hospitality, Dignity, and Violence. Conference on Domestic Violence and Sexual Assault on Christian College Campuses. Uh, my name is Eric Magnuson. I serve here at Spring Harbor University as an assistant professor of theology and as the director of the Master of Arts in Spiritual Formation and Leadership Program. Um, each year, we host what we call the Christian Spirituality Lecture Series to bring in academics and practitioners to come and guide us in reflection, sometimes even in practices that are somehow, whether directly or tangentially, related to Christian spirituality. The conference over the next two days is slightly different from many of our past events, so I wanted to take a minute to describe why the MSFL is hosting this particular conference. Um, back in November of 2004, Rolling Stone published an article on a case of sexual assault and domestic violence that happened on the University of Virginia's campus. Instantly, it got an amazing media buzz. You couldn't, you could not turn on anything, social media, any news site, anything else, without seeing some word about this case. Now, over the next several months, the story got even more and more complicated as there were questions raised about the, the factual nature of the actual story. But whatever we might say about the factuality of the story, it is a story that is true. Because things like that are happening on university campuses, in churches, and in homes each and every day. The struggle, the real tenuous problem that, that emerged out of the debacle of the Rolling Stone article is that the very people that the article hoped to give a voice actually were re-silenced because of the article's problematic nature. Now, as soon as the article surfaced, I personally dealt with um, dealt with some inner turmoil. It ushered me back to a time when I was a pastor. When I was a pastor, I was invited by a friend to come and, uh, and guide his congregation uh, in a lecture on the spirituality of Genesis. In doing so, I got through uh, the first part of the Genesis narrative, laying this foundation for what it means to be a person, what it means to be in relationship with this particular God that we see revealed in Scripture, and I got all the way up to an incredibly problematic text in the story of the founding father and mother of the faith, Abraham and Sarah. But there in Genesis 16, you see this scene where Abraham and Sarah collude together. It's in the text in a horrific act of domestic violence and sexual abuse. That sense of victim fleeing, running away. In this great text of filled with intersectionality, an Egyptian slave woman is abused, ostracized, and left vulnerable. Painfully in the text, she remains nameless, she remains voiceless, she remains vulnerable. Until the moment when God, in just one more brilliant scene of divine hospitality, encounters her in the wilderness and breaks the silence by calling out her name, Hagar. Where have you come from and where are you going? This is a move of rehumanization restoration of dignity is a moment of hope, where she now has been given the agency to name her own story, and at the end of the scene, she becomes the first, an Egyptian slave woman, becomes the first person in scripture to name God. You are the one who sees me. Now, for me, this was merely an academic exercise. It definitely hit me personally, and it's sort of a nice uh, hyper-spiritualized, really great moment in the easy chair kind of way. 
But after that session at that church, on the spirituality of Genesis that night, a family came and approached me, and they said, our daughter was raped, and the church shamed her. They silenced her and left her wandering in the wilderness, and she committed suicide. <coughs> All of this came flooding back into my mind when I was walking through all of the debacle of the Rolling Stone article back uh, last academic year. So this, for me, is why MSFL is hosting this particular conference. Our issues of domestic violence and sexual assault on university campuses is a legal issue? Absolutely. Title IX considerations and other things demand of us that we take these very seriously. But as a university campus that dares to say we followed the God that followed Hagar into the wilderness, this is a much bigger issue for us. This is about justice. This is about dignity. This is about hospitality and redemption and hope. These must be the markers of our community if we are going to claim that we are participants in the loving reign of God as it continues to break into the world. Unfortunately, far too often, the Christian community has been silent on these issues, if not complicit in the silencing and the shaming of victims. But instead, we are invited by God to be participants in God's redemptive work of hospitality, of healing, and of the restoration of dignity and the image-bearing likeness of God in both victims and even, hopefully, in the victimizers. So this is why we, in the MSFL program, wanted to play a part in bringing this conversation to our campus. Now, about the structure of what we're going to be doing over the next 18-ish hours. Right now, we're going to have, uh, well, let me step back. This is going to be an expanding conversation. This afternoon, we're going to have a keynote address. I'll introduce our speaker here in just a moment. Tonight, we will be back, but we will also be joined by uh, what we have called an interdisciplinary panel, but this does not mean it's just an academic conversation in any shape, way, shape, or fashion. We do have members of our faculty who are going to be joining us, but also, um, also members of our, of our staff and administration. As we try to navigate through some of this together, both personally, academically, professionally. And finally, tomorrow at 12.30, we're going to have a roundtable conversation where hopefully we can move from hearing one voice to hearing a few voices to allowing all of us to be liberated to free speech we can share our stories and hear the stories of others around tables together. Hopefully, hopefully that moment tomorrow will be one of those moments like Hagar. Just as her encounter with God liberated her to name her experience and to chant God, hopefully we can name things here that will help us to be a part of God's transformative work. So, this afternoon is my distinct pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker. Professor Jeff Baker is the Director of Clinical Education and an Associate Professor of Clinical Law at the Pepperdine University School of Law in LA. Though it's in Malibu. His scholarship and his clinical practice addresses issues of domestic violence and gender justice in families. Professor Baker graduated from the Vanderbilt University School of Law before returning to his home state of Mississippi, where he practiced healthcare law with the firm of Watkins and Eager. From 2006 to 2013, Professor Baker was an associate professor of law and the director of clinical programs at Faulkner University's at Jones School of Law in Montgomery, Alabama. There, he directed their uh, family violence clinic. He designed and launched, launched their elder law clinic and supervised and taught their externship program. While there, he received both the Montgomery Advisors Martin Luther King Spirit Honors Award and the Justice for Victims Award. But all of that aside, most importantly, 
Jeff is married to Jennifer. And they have two strong girls, Betsy and Kate Scout. Their family life together is a beautiful testimony to the deep convictions that Professor Baker and Jennifer have for cultivating and nurturing family environments of dignity, of peace, of trust, and of empowerment. And personally today, I'd like to say that it's a gift to be able to say that Professor Baker has been a trusted colleague of mine for a number of years. But he's been my best friend now since we met at freshman summer experience at Harding University 22 years ago. We're old. We are old. <laughs> <laughs> for these and for so, so many more other reasons, I'm delighted to welcome you to our campus to challenge and to encourage us today. This afternoon, Professor Baker's lecture is entitled Power, Dignity, and Justice in Student Relationships. So please join me in welcoming Professor Baker. Hey, you all. Uh, I, I live in Los Angeles, but as Eric said, I'm from Mississippi, and sometimes that freaks people out and gives a little dissonance. So I'll try it with my accent, so I'm going to try to tone it down a little bit for the Michiganders. Uh, I've never actually been to Michigan uh, outside of the Detroit airport until this trip. Uh, so, uh, and apparently, like, it's beautiful like this all the time, I've heard. Like, this is obviously, like, fantastic Michigan weather. Uh, and it's, it's really been lovely. I've spent all day here on campus. I was in chapel. I got to worship with you, got to be in this space, and uh, it's been really great to be um, on campus at Spring Harbor. So thank you for doing this, and thank you very much to Eric, uh, my best friend. Uh, you know that you are, you've made it when you can throw conferences for each other uh, and give each other kids and talk. So I'm very excited to be here. Uh, and this is, this is important uh, to me very much, uh, and I, uh, when I left private law practice and started teaching in Alabama, uh, I inherited a um, domestic violence clinic, and legal education and clinic uh, is, is uh, law practice. It's pro bono public interest law practice where the students actually practice law under our supervision. So I, I'm, I'm a practicing teaching lawyer. I'm a professor, I'm a scholar, I get to teach law school classes of all kinds, but my primary work is clinical work, and in clinical work we're actually practicing law for real clients. I inherited a clinic called the Family Violence Clinic, uh, and we represented victims of domestic violence to get protection orders. I had never done anything like this at all. I had never done family law. I had never done any kind of work. I intended to shut this clinic down as soon as I could and do something that was interesting to me. Uh, after one or two clients, I knew that that was probably never going to happen. Uh, after seven years and 400 clients, uh, it is now really part of my life's work. And when I left Alabama to move to California, I thought maybe that would close the chapter on this work, uh, but it absolutely has not. Um, uh, I am, at our university, a member of what we call the SAVE team, Sexual Assault Violence Elimination Team, where we're working on university-wide policies around domestic violence and sexual assault on campus. Um, I run, uh, the clinic that I run now is called the Community Justice Clinic. I'm gonna, I'm gonna loop this all back in, I'm not just trying to give you my resume, but uh, when, we're, when we do community justice, in the Community Justice Clinic, we represent, uh, Nonprofits and NGOs who are doing justice and community development, human rights work in their communities. That includes uh, farm worker women uh, who are organizing in Ventura County who are thrice uh, marginalized by being uh, immigrants, by being undocumented, by being uh, maybe maybe more than thrice marginalized by not by not speaking English, by, by not being citizens and then by being women who are working in the field in impoverished rural areas of California, uh, my clients work with them. We have a client who works in Delhi, India, who is working with victims of sex crimes in Delhi and around the issues of judicial reform, and most of their clients are, uh, are girls under 12. Um, we have uh, some incredible partners throughout the community, and in January, uh, one of my new colleagues is going to launch under my direction the Restoration and Justice Clinic which is going to provide direct legal services to victims of domestic violence, sexual assault, and human trafficking uh, in our community and abroad. So I cannot uh, sort of escape uh, this work. And having daughters uh, and, and, and teaching uh, in universities, the intersections are profound with what we do uh, along these questions. Now, I am, I am not a theologian. Uh, I was a 
my second major was in ministry, and I, and I preach from time to time, but I'm a straight-up lawyer. So, uh, so I'm going to approach this not necessarily from a position of legal liability, but definitely through a lens of justice um, as we think about these issues. Now, uh, trigger warnings are getting some play in the world right now, uh, and, I, and I have some mixed feelings about it, but I do want to say this. I intend to talk in plain terms about what we're going to discuss without euphemisms and straightforwardly about issues that are really pointed about trauma, uh, some real stories and some real life stuff. Um, there are more than 10 people in this room, so it is statistically almost certain that there are people in this room who have experienced uh, sexual trauma, uh, domestic abuse, child abuse, um, and, uh, and there may be people in here who have perpetuated it. Um, I say that uh, not out of a lack of compassion, but to say, um, you know what's coming, uh, and that we are going to talk about some things that uh, can hurt, uh, but that I hope ultimately are empowering and can move us toward places of justice and hope. Uh, I'm a lawyer, so I have to define my terms a little bit. Uh, I'm going to talk about domestic violence, uh, and domestic violence is a, is a slightly different thing from sexual assault, but they're going to intersect, and I'm going to talk about both of those things. Sometimes I'll talk about domestic abuse. Uh, and we'll talk about why in just a little bit. Um, and then, uh, I probably won't, but we should also know that we can also talk about the, this, this in terms of um, intimate partner violence. Intimate partner violence, IPV, uh, is really the more inclusive term, uh, especially when you're dealing with people with different sexual orientation and different forms of relationships uh, that may be uh, outside of what we would consider domestic. Uh, but what we're getting at might also talk about dating violence too. But what we're talking about is violence and abuse and coercion uh, in intimate relationships, whether those intimate relationships have uh, existed for a night or whether they have existed for 20 or 30 years, <coughs> about how those relationships play out. Let me tell you about Aaron. Uh, when I first started at Pet, these aren't their real names, by the way. Um, Aaron I was a student of mine in my first year of teaching at Pepperdine. Um, she, uh, in her first, she was an Ivy League grad, uh, and she had come to Pepperdine Law School. Uh, in the spring semester of her first year, she was uh, going to take uh, her final. While she was sitting in her final, her ex-boyfriend emailed to every member of the class a video that he had just uploaded on a revenge porn site in California. Uh, a video that she did not know existed, that he had taken of her masturbating while they were dating, and sent it to all of her classmates, um, and posted it online with her name, with her contact information, uh, and sent her into an incredible spiral. Absolutely traumatized, not violent, physically, deeply spiritually violent threw her into depression, uh, embarrassment, humiliation, and scandal, uh, pushed her into a dark place during law school. Um, she graduated last year, she's taken the bar. She has cooperated with the FBI to prosecute him, and he's going to jail. She was the J Jane Doe in two or three lawsuits to shut down the revenge porn websites in California, and to put those guys in jail. Uh, so, uh, it was an astonishing crime. It was an astonishing reaction. Uh, and she reclaimed power from that um, by getting very much deeply involved in the movements around uh, those really exploitative uh, social media um, weapons. Um, I met a fresh a senior who just graduated from Pepperdine uh, two years ago when she was a freshman. And by the way, I have only ever worked at Christian colleges, so all of my stories are out of this kind of environment. Uh, Rose was raped her freshman year by an upperclassman uh, in her dorm. Uh, she did not report it. I'm going to talk about that in a little bit, maybe. Later on, she and other girls were videoed with a surreptitious uh, um, camera in their shower in their dorms. She did report that. They located the camera. They never located the guys. Um, but this was a deeply intrusive 
um, deeply abusive move uh, to um, humiliate, and subjugate, and victimize those women. Um, one of the bravest things I've ever seen was my student in Alabama. I was teaching a class on, uh, it was advanced family law seminar, and everybody had to give a paper, they had to give a presentation. Uh, my student, Brandy, I'll call her, she was writing a paper on domestic violence, and she was giving a paper on domestic violence policy in America. Uh, the week before she was to give her paper, her boyfriend held a gun to her head in her bedroom and called her father and told him that he was holding a gun to her head and then told her father everything that he had been doing to her uh, and then went on the lam and told her that he was going to kill her. Uh, she kept coming to school. He was, a, he was a fugitive. She called the police. They were looking for him everywhere. We had to actually put police at the gates of the university until he was finally caught in a high-speed chase in Georgia after going on a crime spree. But before they caught him, she stood up and gave her presentation to the seminar class on domestic violence. And no one else in the room except her best friend and I knew that he was literally uh, out looking for her and we had police at the gates while she was giving her talk. Now I've told you three really dramatic stories, but I want you to see incredible abuse and incredible resilience and incredible hope uh, from three women who were my students uh, in ordinary sorts of universities just like this one who have interacted with some incredibly evil and, and really destructive stuff. They are dramatic stories, but they are not unusual. Uh, I said before, in seven years of running the clinic in Alabama, we had something like 400 clients just through our clinic. We were collaborators with a program called the One Place Family Justice Center, which was wraparound comprehensive services. And with, within a year of launching, we had uh, between 900 and 1,000 clients. Uh, that's three or four different people coming in every day in a town uh, the size of Montgomery, Alabama, with about 250,000 people. Um, it was, uh, it is incredible. These stories are uh, engaging, but they are just illustrative of a very common epidemic phenomenon. And today I want us to speak very clearly about what that means to us in Christian higher education. Um, and, uh, and so let's talk about sort of the reality of that. Now, um, often when we have these kind of conversations, people say, well, this happens to men too, right? This happens to men too, it doesn't just happen to women. But I want to put a little barrier around that and say this. One in three women in America, according to the CDC, will experience physical or sexual abuse uh, by an intimate partner or a family member during the course of their lives. One in three American women. If we live in a country with 300 million citizens, and if more than half of our 350 million citizens are women, then a third of that is 58 million people. How many countries would we bomb if 58 million people were being assaulted by someone in our world? Um, this is incredibly common and epidemic. And anywhere between 80 and 90% of all domestic violence, domestic abuse uh, and intimate partner violence are perpetuated by men against women. So there are, examples, there are, there are exceptions, um, but there are few exceptions. By and large, the vast majority uh, it, uh, is abuse perpetrated by men against women. And my, my working thesis that I want to say out loud and very clearly is that I believe that this is a gendered issue. Um, there are uh, some examples. This is a gendered issue. Uh, what we're talking about today has a direct connection to some um, to the more dramatic things we see in the world. Malala being shot in the head, going to school, Boko Haram uh, kidnapping hundreds of Nigerian schoolgirls because they dared to go to school. Uh, the Taliban uh, putting uh, burqas on women all the way to frat boys uh, and sexual assault on secular campuses in Greek life, all the way up to whatever is happening on this campus. It is a spectrum, and I believe that this is the global human rights question of our age. The dignity of women and girls in our world is what is going to define us for the next century. 
as we work through this. Um, one in three American teenagers uh, have experienced violence in dating relationships. 90% of that 33% are girls being abused by the guys they're dating, and three-fourths never report it to an authority, to their school, to the police. 80% of girls um, suffering physical violence by their boyfriends continue to date them after the violence. And in fact, uh, women who are in long-term relationships with abusive men will leave five to seven times before they leave for good statistically. Um, and we're going to talk about why that is in just a minute. But get this, the most reliable statistics through a couple of very important studies show that one in five women in college will be sexually assaulted in some way. 20%. It is more dangerous, it is more likely for women to be raped in college than to not be in college. It is more likely <laughs> And it is more dangerous uh, for women to be um, raped in college than not. Um, and that ought to be an incredible uh, warning to us. One third of those students um, have been, one third of all college students have been physically assaulted by a dating partner. Um, and date rape, meaning someone that you know, accounts for 70% of sexual assaults. Um, and 68% of young women who report being raped knew their attacker either as a boyfriend or a friend. There's some controversy with those numbers a little bit, but let's just pretend like it's not half. It's not one in five. Let's just pretend it's one out of ten. We would still be having this lecture, right? I mean, we still need, I mean, even if it's half as bad as we know it is, it's still uh, an incredible crisis. Um, so there are almost certainly women in this room, uh, and there are without a doubt women in this university who have suffered violence, intimidation, and abuse by men that they have dated uh, and have been with while in college right now. Uh, it happens. And listen, I'm not coming down to Spring Arbor. I'm just standing in an American university. Uh, so this is what this is what our reality is. The problem hides in shadows and behind closed doors. By the nature of this thing, it happens in dark places. It happens when people are alone, and abusers rely on that. Um, uh, it happens uh, constantly, and violence and domestic violence in America, uh, as best we understand it. Uh, is no respecter of race or affluence or age or sadly even religion. Uh, all of the statistics that I just showed are constant. The, the incidents of domestic violence and sexual assault are constant across every line, economically, socioeconomically, with education and in religion. Uh, this is no less prevalent in the church than it is in the world. Uh, Across race, religion, economics, the rates of domestic violence remain constant. That means upper middle class, suburban, Christian, white kids at Pepperdine, uh, unex uh, uneducated, poor, urban, black clients in Alabama, evangelical, working class students in the upper Midwest. Um, this, is, this is where it is happening. It is happening everywhere, right here among us. So, so what are we really talking about? What is violence? What is domestic violence? In, in, as we talk about this term, I'm going to actually ask you a question. That's sort of bad pedagogy. I've just been talking a lot, and I'm about to actually ask you a question. What is the violence for? What is, what is the abuse, the, the sexual or physical violence, what is it for? Control. Control and ego. What do you say? Power. Um, this is right. Uh, violence, we talk about domestic violence, but the physical violence is just one tool uh, in an arsenal of tools to exercise power and control over another person. We are not talking about temper issues. We're not talking about anger management. We're not talking about substance abuse. We're talking about coercion. It is the targeted attempt to subjugate another person. It is the systemic, varied, intentional strategies to coerce one partner to do something against their will uh, so that the other person can diminish their dignity and worth for their own objective.
objectives. It's coercive control, and we see it happen across many spectra, right? Uh, it can be emotional, it can be financial, it can be relational, uh, and it is an attempt to exert one's power over another person. Uh, and this is going to start intersecting pretty quickly with the spiritual disciplines of formation. It is, what is your work? Uh, who controls whom uh, in the world? Uh, power and control is the root of domestic abuse. And it is the root of sexual assault on college campuses. It is the, it is the root of um, intimate partner violence. Um, there was a... Um, uh, Sorry, I was going to tell you a social science study, uh, but I'm not because I'm thinking about time, so I'm going to set that aside. We'll talk about that later, maybe. Um, I said earlier that there's a statistic, a true statistic, that people will leave five to seven times before they leave for good. Uh, and that is one of the most common questions that anybody who doesn't think well about this or hasn't had any experience will say to someone, why doesn't you just leave? Um, I've heard many students say, as soon as he laid a hand on me, I would leave. Right? Uh, those are the kind of compromise. Maybe not a lot of people who self selected to come to this will think that, but that is a very common thought that you will get out in the world. Why doesn't she just leave? Why doesn't someone leave? Someone doesn't leave because of love, um, because of dependence, because of disappointment, because of embarrassment, because of. Many, many reasons. And here's another, well, so let me give you an example. If a woman has come to the United States and she's not documented, and her status in this country is dependent on the one who is abusing her, why doesn't she leave? And then that status of being dependent on the guy uh, who gives her cover to be in the country becomes a lever of abuse and coercion and control. I've had plenty of clients who said, I never want to call the police. I just want a protection order so that I can get away. Why don't you want to call the police? Well, because if he goes to jail, I use my child support. And if he loses his job, I lose my health care. Uh, this is one reason why I was a big fan of the ACA, because I want victims of domestic violence to be able to have health insurance that isn't related to their partner's job, right? Now, in a Christian college, why might someone not talk about this? Threats of what? Violence or okay, threats of violence or isolation. Why might someone else not talk about what has happened in a Christian college specifically? Because he doesn't have sex with the guy in their shame of dead health. All right. Uh, there could be cultural pressures. At the school we went to, you get kicked out for that. Uh, you get kicked out for spending the night on the wrong sofa, uh, whether or not you had sex or not. Uh, and so if you're dependent on a scholarship in this place, if you're the first in your family to ever go to school and they are scrimping to keep you here, is there a tendency to say, I might not want to risk getting kicked out? By the way, if you've never talked to your nurses about the rates of abortions in Christian schools, ask them. Uh, because there are a lot of girls who will uh, seek desperate ends to not show up uh, with an unintentional pregnancy and risk getting kicked out of school. And all of these uh, issues of shame and fear and judgment and culture that wraps around this are intense. And even if I went to your beautiful chapel today, and it was beautiful, and I've been through lots of college chapels, and it was beautiful. But if you are, if you are not feeling like you are connected to the core crowd who are worshiping and praising and being part of that experience, and that you will find yourself drifting to the margins more and more and more. And if you have this kind of secret and this kind of shame, then that becomes a lever of abuse and power over the person who perpetrated the attack in the first place. Um, and in and in California, we've got this beautiful new law called affirmative consent, which I love, where you actually, where it's not no means no, it's yes means yes. Like you actually, we have to have a policy in place that says that someone has to affirmatively consent to have sex, not just say, I don't want to. Um, but if you're in these kinds of environments, those lines are hard to draw. When you're in a particular situation, it's hard to figure out what to do and someone can latch onto that and 
and abuse them uh, and make someone be more and more independent. <coughs> now, what makes an abuser and what makes a victim? Social science and psychology tells us that there is one statistically significant indicator about who will be an abuser and who will be a victim. And it is the same thing. What make, what is the best predictor of who will be an abuser and who will be a victim? Class. Insecurity. Um, no. <laughs> Dr. Foster, no. <laughs> there was a chapter that I remember. Um, what was that? History of what? Oh, yes. Witnessing abuse in your own home. Now, here's my theory, uh, and it plays out. When you see abuse in your own home, it resets what you think is a normative, healthy relationship. Uh, if you don't, if you grow up in a, I was talking to a, a dear friend of mine uh, this week about this talk. She is gay. She was talking about a relationship that she had with a girlfriend who blocked her in the kitchen one time and then later on pushed her. Um, and in the course of three months of dating, those were the three things that happened. But my friend said, I'm out. I want nothing more to do with that. I'm done. Because she looked at that and said, that is not healthy. And those were red flags and signals. And she was like, I'm done. I'm and we know people like that, and hopefully that's the that's what you saw when someone acts in a coercive way to you. Uh, you say, "I'm done." But imagine that you grew up where that is what you saw as your as your the the, the relationships that set your expectations. Then that is going to to make you sort of immune to what's going on, and it may teach you what a relationship is supposed to be. I've had clients who were 17 and had been dating someone for six months and their parents were like, he is abusing her. I've also had women who have been married literally for 50 years and are in their 80s seeking a protection on her. Finally, after 40 or 50 years. Um, it, is, um, it is what you grow to expect and adapt to. And now I'm gonna take this just a little bit farther. When we tell someone to man up, when we hear people talk about um, throwing like a girl, or if someone says, you're so gay, as an insult, or um, if you hear guys talking about bitches or hoes or slams, uh, which I have recently learned is the Greek term for women that you just party with. You don't even give them a name. They're slams. That, maybe that's just a southern thing. I don't know. But, uh, but, uh, but it's happening out in Greek life. In feminist parlance, that is objectifying women. But it is also objectifying men. And it is saying that you are just a sexual animal predator. And, you, and the way that you de demonstrate your manhood is by your conquest. And if you can't do that, then you are something less than that. Um, and it is, uh, it is uh, hinging a woman's worth on her value to a man. And it is hinging a man's worth on his ability to dominate a woman. And if you have been taught that, then, uh, then you will fall into those roles, right? We will all respond in that way. Now, here's where I might get a little bit preachy. If we are in a religious uh, community that says that women are subjugated to men, then it might be that that patriarchal church is giving cover to someone who might abuse someone. Now, now, now don't hear me to say that complementarian churches or patriarchal churches cause abuse, but I'm saying that they give shelter to abuse when the abuse is going to there because uh, I have had many clients who have said, my husband said uh, that he is the head of the household, right? And so he gets to do to me X, Y, and Z. So we live in a culture, and we are in a church culture that uh, sends these signals. When I'm walking through the mall with my daughters, and I see huge pictures of sexualized women, I want them to go uh, play soccer like bad. Like, 
I want them to see women doing things with their bodies that are more powerful and strong and not dependent on a male gaze for their value. And, uh, and we have seen, I've seen client after client, friend after friend of, of, of young women where their whole value is based on the, re the reaction they get from men, either from their fathers or from their peers or from whoever looks at them and says, you are hot. Uh, or you are beautiful always without ever complimenting her brain or her power or her strength or her talent because that sets her worth in, in relation to whatever association she's getting from me. And if that is true, then, uh, then the woman uh, begins to think that I have to earn that value. Now likewise, that it's incredibly toxic to a man because the man never sees uh, a woman other than as an object uh, for instance, I follow a great website called Pigtail Pals and Ball Cap Boys, my buddies. Write that down if you're a parent. Pigtail Pals and Ball Cap Buddies. And she uh, is an activist. Um, Melissa Wardy, she has a book called Redefining Girly. Uh, and it's beautiful. But she has been really criticizing Disney because Disney will have a movie uh, like, uh, which I love, Big Hero 6. It wasn't Disney. Yeah, it's Disney. Big Hero 6. Big Hero 6 is, I love, love it, incredible movie, but in all of their marketing, they only have the male characters on all of the marketing. They only have the male characters, not the girl characters who are rad. Uh, and, and, and the reason that they said so uh, when Disney was responding to some criticism about this, it was like, well, boys won't want to buy that. The girls will buy the boys' stuff, but the boys won't buy the girls' stuff. That is a very insidious, nuanced, weird thing, right? That because the boys will go, oh, that's for girls, that this massive corporation will like play along with that. And it perpetuates this problem that, that boys cannot see girls as anything other than something that they objectify. And this rolls up into college culture. And so boys get here thinking that they are meant to get a woman and the women are here to be gotten uh, because that's what, what they've been taught to do and it perpetuates all of this. And in Christian colleges, I think we, not just you, we have an institutional and a cultural naivete about this. People are having sex at Spring Arbor University. Uh, and it is happening, but it is happening in ways that are in shadows and in dark places with a coating of shame and judgment and fear, and then that becomes a powerful lever for someone to abuse and dominate another person for an extra level of power and control. Um, and so it's not to say that Spring Harbor is harboring abusers. Abusers are here, and victims are here. And it becomes incumbent upon us as educators and people who leave our schools to understand that, to respond to it, and then how do we do it? Um, so here's a little theology. Um, I think this all flows out of the Imago Dei. It all flows out of the, the creation where uh, the Genesis writer says, attributing this to God, in our image we created them, male and female. Um, male and female created in the image of God. And then we hear this echoed again in Galatians 3.28. There is no male, no female in Christ. The two greatest commands, to love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, to love your neighbor as yourself. In the Sermon on the Mount, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. If we all have the, the presence of God, if we are all stamped in the image of God, and if we are all commanded to love as we would be loved, then there is no space for subjugation. There is no space for hierarchy. There is no space for saying this person is more human than this person. Lincoln apocryphally said, if I would not be a slave, so I would not be a master. Anyone who believes that women are subject to men, subjugated to men, is not heeding the gospel. If you would not be abused, so you cannot abuse. If you would not be subjugated and owned and oppressed, then you cannot do that. Um, 
And it's not to say, would you treat your mom that way? Would you treat your sister that way? It's that you don't treat people that way. Um, I feel like I know what I'm going to get from this audience, but at this point, I usually say, how many of you think that women are human beings? <laughs> okay, if you all, if you all assent to the proposition <coughs> that women are human beings, um, then that imbues those human beings with a dignity that is from God. And we cannot have a system, a culture, a society that subjugates women to men or objectifies women for the male gaze or teaches men that they may own and possess and conquer women and have it be square with the gospel. Uh, to square about what God would have us be done. Human dignity requires love. Love is the key to justice and peace. Love requires critical, heavy weight of self-awareness and discipline and, uh, and, and the commitment to do what one would have done to one's self. Um, and this is why I believe that when the Taliban will shoot Malala in the head to keep her from going to school. Uh, it is an expression of, uh, it, is, it, is a, it is an attempt to rob her of her humanity and her dignity. Um, and that is the same thing as a frat boy saying, I'm going to hook up with that slam tonight uh, and, and notch another victory. I don't know if y'all just heard about this uh, prep school uh, case in Massachusetts, high end elite prep school, and they had a practice uh, where the senior boys had a uh, contest every year to see how many undergraduate girls, not undergraduate, teenage girls they could have sex with before they graduated, and they got prizes for it. Um, that's high school. And so we see that these things are all connected because women um, do not exist for the gratification of men. Women are not to be possessed and conquered, and men are more than insecure sexual animals. So to close, I want to address four groups of people relatively quickly. As someone, I, the greatest speech I ever heard said, in closing, but not yet. Uh, in closing, but not yet, I want to speak to four groups of people. I don't know if they're all represented here. I hope not, but we'll see. Abusers, friends of victims, victims, and then the university itself. First, to the guys and men in here who have hit or beaten or intimidated or threatened or embarrassed or shamed or coerced or scared the women in your life, in order to maintain power and control over them. This is not manhood, it is cowardice. Um, you are not entitled to possess your girlfriend, you are not entitled to possess the girl at the party, or your wife, or your classmate. You are not entitled to make sexual demands on her. You do not have the right to coerce her into doing anything against her will. Uh, you have received a lie. You have received a lie from the people and the culture and the church that has led you to believe that it is yours to subjugate a woman. That is a lie. It is not true. It is not from God. We are more than consumers of women. We are more than cowards and bullies, and women are not for our gratification. Loving, strong men pull alongside the women in their life to encourage and strengthen and empower them just like we hope to be empowered and strengthened and encouraged. Uh, we are actually supposed to lay down our lives as Christ laid down his life for the church. Um, we are not supposed to demand sacrifices for our own pleasure. Find your worth. We must find our own worth from the value that God gives us and not through the power that we project on women to friends of abusers and friends of victims. You will know people who are in these relationships. You will suspect abuse among your friends. Do not stand by silently. It is a really intense temptation to live and let live, to think that this is someone else's problem, to think that this is someone else's issue, to just go on your way. Do not stand by. Seek guidance, pray, 
Go to that girl and say that you are worried about her. Tell her your own stories. Talk about your own things. If you have a friend who is doing this to a woman who is too aggressive, you stop it. You say that you cannot tolerate it. Do not let your friends suffer alone. But, a caution, receive those stories, but don't be the next person in a long line of people who have told her what to do. Don't say, you have to leave him. Don't say, if you don't leave him, I, I'm going to have to just wash my hands and dust off my feet. You hold on faithfully to her because it may take some time. You may be right, but she may not see it. And it may take some time for her to get there. Honor her agency, honor her uh, readiness to leave, and don't give up. Because when it's time to leave, that is the time of her greatest vulnerability, and she needs shelter and a place to come. So be ready to act and be ready to receive. To our sisters in here who have been abused by families, boyfriends, you are not alone. You may be afraid or embarrassed to discuss it. You may feel fear. You may feel stupid. Someone may have made you feel crazy. But you will find plenty of people willing to talk to. You will find plenty of people in solidarity. You will find plenty of people who have shared this experience. You do not need to hide it. Uh, you can have power by telling your story and reclaiming your worth. You are God's daughter created for his glory and his grace. You are worthy of love and joy and peace and hope and beauty. And you deserve someone who is going to empower you and, and contribute to your walk instead of owning you. Now to Spring Arbor and to all of us in higher ed, I would say this. We're in a moment right now because of Rolling Stone, because of UVA, uh, because of Title IX, because of the Cleary Act. Because of all of the pressure that we're under from the federal government, from the Department of Justice, and the Office of Civil Rights, and from all these investigations that are going on. Uh, and I think that is good because it, it makes us come to terms with it. But we have a fundamental choice to make. And this can be really tricky. And I'm a lawyer, and so I have to worry about my own tendency to do this. But we as an institution have a, have a temptation to operate from a space of liability and exposure to risk and trying to avoid a federal investigation, trying to avoid a Title IX lawsuit, trying to avoid all of these things. So we'll put in policies uh, and we'll have some good structures, but we want to make sure that we're not going to be sued. That is a posture, and I would suggest to you that all of those things are important. But our fundamental choice is this, will we respond uh, in a way that is more interested in civil liability and risk assessment and regulatory compliance, or will we be interested in building communities and cultures of justice and empowerment and flourishing? We know that effective responses to DV and domestic violence and sexual assault are coordinated responses across communities. So we have an obligation to intervene, we have an obligation to respond, but we have an exceptionally greater uh, response to that. And I would say as Christians, holding ourselves out as Christians, we have an even more profound response to make sure that we are seeking justice and to make right what has gone wrong, to reconcile and to bring redemption together. We must make abuse and violence rare and intolerable so that it is illuminated where it is and rooted out for the empowerment of our students. We have an obligation to our students. Uh, we, should ex we should not hide from these phenomena. We should not pretend like they don't exist. We need to get our heads out of the sand and say that they are here. We must expect it and not be surprised in it um, because it is epidemic. But in higher ed, in a Christian higher ed, we claim the sacred space of building communities where young adults become uh, formed and, and shaped for their professions, for their churches, for civic engagement, for neighborhoods, for families, and we must prepare them to do this. We are in the work of identity formation, and identity formation means that we are building people into their own lives about what they need to expect. And if we are true to our calling, we build communities of dignity and love 
with the highest expectations of peace and justice. We will build communities of learning where students know and honor their own worth and the dignity of their peers and their partners. This is our hope for today, to seek justice and to build communities of peace. So we must be aware, we must be brave, we must insist on our own dignity, and we must insist on the dignity of everyone around us all the time. Thank you. God bless you.